Hello and welcome to the National Incubation Center Detox. My name is Dishan Bin Shahid and I'm the head of program at National Incubation Center. Today we have a very special guest from uh, USA who was here to attend the Park US Expo which was held during the weekend. Uh, the expo was organized by the team at the National Incubation Center. Chris was here to attend the expo as a speaker. Chris, welcome to the National Incubation Center. How are you doing today? I'm great. Uh, awesome to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I look forward to our chat today. Chris is an angel investor and he's, he is also a university professor who teaches public policy, business communication, uh, business ethics in different uh, U.S. universities. Chris also invested some seven, eight years back in a Pakistani startup. So let's just hear more about Chris from himself. So Chris, what's your story? Tell us about your journey. Uh, happy to do so. I'll try to be brief. Um, I'm a Midwest boy uh, from the United States. Uh, I grew up in a state that most Pakistanis have probably never heard of called Nebraska, right in the middle of the country. Uh, my parents were farmers and ranchers. We were, in agri we were in the vertical of agriculture. And one of the things we I learned quickly being young is a lot of hard work. Prices aren't very good. It's a tough vertical to make money in. So Myself and my siblings, uh, we started thinking about what's next, and we went to college and grad school and just uh, kind of developed our lives. But the reason I, I, I start there in terms of my journey is just great, hardworking parents, great middle-class community, people looking out for each other, taking care of each other, working hard, just trying to improve their lives. So you learn a great work ethic. Uh, growing up in a place like that. And, uh, you know, that's something that I see here in Pakistan as well, particularly among many of the young people, just the willingness to work really, really hard. It's something I recognize and I applaud. So I did uh, uni uh, undergrad university uh, at a public university in Nebraska, moved to California for law school, attended law school at a place called Santa Clara in the Bay Area. Uh, after graduating from Santa Clara, practiced business and corporate law for a number of years. Uh, had an opportunity to make the move into academia in roughly 1997-1998 where I became a, a tenure track professor in the business school at a, a university called Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. <clears throat> San Luis Obispo, where the heck's that? Well, 3.5 hour drive south of San Francisco, three hour drive north from LAX. We sit right in the middle of the state. The beauty of the location is it offers all of the good things about California without the traffic or the pollution or the uh, crazy, crazy high housing prices of LA or the Bay Area. Uh, but I've been an academic the last 26 years. I'm a law professor that teaches in a business school at a polytech polytechnic university, which means the main focus of the university are colleges such as engineering, architecture, agriculture, college of science and math. But one of the things I enjoy about teaching in a business school is as a law faculty, I've got to try to demonstrate how my discipline brings value to business and it's not a cost center. And a part of my job in research and teaching requires me to connect with good people out of other disciplines like accounting, finance, management, information systems, supply chain, marketing, you name it. So. Uh, uh, I've been living and raising my family in California since roughly uh, late 1980s. I'm a Midwest boy that was supposed to return home to my family who remained in the Midwest, but I became the prodigal son that remained in California and never looked back. Just tell us more about the you know, investment side. How did you get into the startup investments and all? What, what inspired you to do that? Yeah, it was no part of a grand plan. It was more of a, I'm the type of person that once I start thinking about an idea and percol percolating on it, I try to learn as much about it as I can, and I just start to try to execute on myself. But, but I think the genesis of my interest stems from the fact that, A, in terms of the, the type of law that I practiced before entering academia related to business, and then secondly, my uh, career and track teaching in a business school, you, you can't help but be, and you're naturally exposed to things like entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship. And then <clears throat> once that happens, you start to reflect on questions like, oh, how can I be a part of this in an interesting way where I can intellectually engage, meet interesting people, learn a ton, and 
hopefully along the way, if you make some right investments, uh, obtain a return that is higher than a, a 2% return of interest at a bank on your money. Right. So those of you who don't know, uh, I was part of the team who used to connect the Pakistan Startup Cup. And back in 2015, Chris also invested in one of the startups uh, from Startup Cup called Caller. So Chris, tell us about that. How did you end up investing in uh, Caller? Great question. Interesting story. Uh, I'll start at the macro level. In my academic career at Cal Poly, one of the things I've tried to do as an academic to engage and stay connected to things happening outside of my amazingly beautiful little beach town where I live that are happening in other parts of the world was to plug into the Fulbright organization. And great organization, great people. Uh, one of its purposes is to s support financially people like me who are interested in going to other places and collaborating with people and learning a lot. So uh, the kind of the niche that I developed and became attracted to was becoming a part of the Fulbright program to uh, visit interesting countries that were emerging markets that were starting to show an interest in entrepreneurship. And so my first company, excuse me, not country, not company, that I visited was Tunisia. And the year was 2011. And they had just completed the revolution there. The dictator Ben Ali had been run out of Tunisia and he fled into exile into the into the Saudi into Saudi Arabia. And they were looking for a new start and they saw entrepreneurship as a path forward. So I was on the Fulbright roster as a business professor that might know a little bit about entrepreneurship and be interested in it. So I got on a plane and I went to Tunisia and collaborated with some uh, institutions and, uh, and um, universities there on this topic. I had a great time. My next visit uh, under the Fulbright program was then to Pakistan in 2015. Similar experience, I came to NUST in 2015 to here in Islamabad to collaborate with them on similar issues. I'll swing back to Islamabad in a minute because I'm not done. In 2016, I think it was, uh, my next stop was Mongolia. Uh, landing and flying into Ulaanbaatar, uh, amazing place, some of the most incredible beauty I have ever seen in my life. Um, they too were interested in entrepreneurship issues, but Tunisia, you know, Tunisia was interesting. At that time, a country of 11 million people, roughly. A lot of young people like Pakistan, smart, motivated, uh, technology savvy. Uh, many of them are engineers or studying STEM, but the challenge they have there is they only have 11 million people. It's a small market and their geographic location is problematic. Then I come to Pakistan in 2015, totally different landscape, similar, lots of young people, uh, technologically savvy, good universities, uh, starting to look at uh, entrepreneurship as a way to move people forward but obviously some other challenges as well. And then you visit a, a country like uh, Mongolia, only three million people. Um, it's never gonna be a, pay a place where uh, the fintech, fintech ecosystem is gonna take off and develop. So we had some interesting discussions there about things like sustainable uh, tourism. And then my final pit stop was Southern Italy, uh, spending time in Naples under a different, um, uh, in Napoli, uh, in Southern Italy, under a different program, but uh, again, addressing the same issues. My point of that is that story and that kind of macro approach is a big part of what initially brought me to Islamabad in 2015 and why I was here. And when I came here, again, I worked with NUST University, the National University of Science, Sciences and Technology, on a variety of entrepreneurship issues and other things as well. So. Uh, that's part one of the story that was far longer than uh, it should have been, but I hope you found it interesting nonetheless. While I was in Islamabad in 2015, to answer your real question more directly, uh, toward the end of my stay, I get a LinkedIn message out of the blue from an entrepreneur named Umar Adnan. Uh, who uh, was himself a graduate of NUST, and he himself had done a Fulbright visit to the United States 
where he obtained a master's degree in electrical engineering from Arizona State, another great university. He had returned to Islamabad to uh, launch his own company, which at that time was kind of a combination of a name between E4 Technologies and Kalar. Uh, I get a LinkedIn invite and a message out of the blue from Umar saying, hey, um, I'm a fellow Fulbrighter. I uh, hear uh, there's an American in town. We don't see many folks like you these days. The security was tight at that time, so there weren't many foreigners in Islamabad in those days. He said, I've been approached by somebody interested in acquiring my company or at a minimum investing. I'd like to pick your brain because I hear you teach in a business school. So one of the best decisions I ever made was to, because I was busy at that time and running out of time to get back to the US, do some shopping for my kids and wife before I get on the plane. But I made the time to meet with him and I'm glad I did because the more I learned about him, his journey, his story, what type of person he was, what type of startup he was trying to build and where he wanted to go with it, uh, I could see that uh, I had a background that could actually support what he wanted to do and add value. Uh, I, I didn't look at Umer and his company to say, oh, I just want to be an investor. I, I asked the question, how do I help? And so we kept talking and building the relationship uh, make, uh, to get to the, 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 the main punchline of the story. Uh, I learned enough, he became comfortable enough where uh, I became his very first investor and wrote him his first check as an angel investor. So uh, I've been collaborating with Umer ever since to further develop his company, to get it to the point where the revenue it's generating is uh, even more impressive and substantial, and to hopefully uh, give him and his team uh, a meaningful exit down the road. So that's how I came to, in, uh, in terms of investing in Pakistan, that's how I arrived, why I arrived, and why I decided to move forward. Okay, fantastic. I think uh, the most interesting takeaway uh, from this story for Startup Founder is that reach out to people who you want to narrate your startup, your story, your business idea, or if you're seeking any help, or seeking investment or whatever, right? You have to reach out to the people, right? Don't be shy in reaching out to the people because that's that's where it all starts. Like we've, we've, we've just heard from Chris, right Chris? So, um, you know, so you've been here in 2015 and you're here now, uh, you know, for this particular Pakistan US Expo, which by the way, was an amazing event held, uh, the la held, 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 held this weekend. So Chris, uh, what is the difference, you know, that were you able to observe any difference uh, how was the Pakistan startup ecosystem back in 2015? Uh, you know, the story that you just told us, uh, I, I, would, I would assume that you actually had trust in the ecosystem back in 2015 as well, right? Because there were not a lot of investments coming in and you wrote your first check for a Pakistani startup, right? And the startup ecosystem that we have now in 2023, what are your observations? Do you see any difference? Yeah, great question. Yes, I, I see a big difference. When I was here in 2015, as best I could tell in the limited time I was here, uh, it, it seemed like the entrepreneurship movement was just starting to take off and just starting to percolate. But the things that attached to that movement to really make it take off like a rocket ship, ship um, were only starting to develop. I, I remember seeing and scanning all of Pakistan for uh, accelerators, incubators. And I was starting to see a few of the things like that coming online. I started, when I looked at universities and their curriculum and programs and majors, I started to see a few universities starting to develop and, and incorporate those programs and that curriculum and, and start that dance and journey themselves. Um, but that's about it. I didn't meet a whole lot of entrepreneurs like Umer that wanted to do what he wanted to do and, and build, you know, for example, a cross-border company as opposed to something that served the Pakistan market. Um, I'm pretty sure that there were no venture capitalists in town at that time, and I never met a single other angel investor. 
So that was all missing. Now fast forward to 2023 and what do we see today? Well, the landscape looks vastly different. It's become much more robust. Uh, a number of people and institutions in Pakistan obviously deserve a lot of credit for doing some hard work and heavy lifting to take what I saw and experienced in 2015 and ramp it up to what we see today. So what do we see today? Eh, entrepreneurship classes and programs and concentrations are at pretty much every university. There are incubators and accelerators all over the place now. And uh, more importantly, uh, a number of them are doing uh, great work and significant work. Uh, today I'm touring the National Incubation Center and I've, uh, you know, to be honest, be, uh, been fairly blown away. It's, it's already exceeded my expectations. If it helps, and just by a comparative measure, I've walked through a lot of incubators and accelerators in the U.S., and I can report to you, I can give you a, a, an excellent grade as your professor <laughs> uh, in terms of what the NIC here in Islamabad is doing. You know, it's, it's, it, it, there's an energy here. There's all kinds of young people. I've already met some other founders, some uh, investors, some alumni, some mentors that are involved. Uh, as you and I both attended the, the uh, U.S. PAC Expo over the weekend, lots of not only local venture capitalists and funds in town now, but a large number of foreign investors as well. And then, of course, the entrepreneurs themselves. You know, it, I see here what I saw happen in China, the, the number of youth that are at these events that are interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, that attend these programs and these talks and these events, etc. Vast difference than what I saw in 2015. So things have really developed in a positive way, in a very impressive way as well. However, the, the unknown question is, where does it land? Uh, meaningful foreign investment never really started to come into Pakistan until 2020, 2021, 2022. And the vast majority of those deals were seed deals. And we all know that those are going to take, particularly in an emerging market like Pakistan, five, at least, potentially 10 years. So that lands us to 2030. And um, I can report that the outsiders, as we monitor and observe Pakistan, what we are asking is when, 2020, when 2030 rolls around, are we going to see a significant number of meaningful exits where everybody in the hierarchy wins? The founder makes out like a bandit. The early employees who receive stock options make out like bandits. And the investors do well and get a good return as well. Um, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, I know you are as well, but uh, the reality is that story remains to be, remains, uh, the final chapter has not been written. Indeed, indeed. Uh, we've come a long way and we've got to go a long way. Uh, still, but it's very encouraging to hear some kind uh, feedback from, uh, you know, a person who was here eight years back and, you know, could, could make those observations. So, Chris, uh, you know, now we, you know, will try to know you more personally, right? And, you know, would love to hear who inspires you the most? Who's the personality that inspires you? Oh, uh, that's a great question, too. You know, uh, as a young boy growing up back in the Midwest, um, myself and all my friends, we did sports. That's what we found joy in. That's how we built friendships and connected one another. So our idols growing up were professional athletes, you know, for most of us. So I remember my heroes were people like Dr. J. I'm dating myself here. Dr. J in basketball. You know, I was a big Pittsburgh Steeler fan. Franco Harris and Terry Bradshaw, uh, professional players for a football team in, in America. So those were the type of people so many of us back there looked up to, to as kind of our heroes and superstars. But outside of that, you know, my story is really not unique. Uh, just people in my family uh, and my local community that I saw were great people that just worked hard, 
Um, they tried to make life about others rather uh, about others rather than themselves. Very humble to get these people to talk to themselves, whether it was your father or mother or the father of your best friend in high school. Um, you know, they, they were uncomfortable talking about themselves because they wanted to know how you were you were doing. So those are the types of people that influenced my life. Of course, the coaches I had as a young man and some of the teachers. Um, I, so I don't know that my story is particularly impressive or unique in that regard. Fairly normal, but uh, I wouldn't change it for anything. So, so this is going now. This is going to be a, a quick fire round. So you have to answer very quickly. Right? What's your favorite city in Pakistan or the U.S.? Uh, every anyway. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, favorite city. Well, in the U.S., it would definitely be uh, San Luis Obispo, where I live. Uh, you know, in terms of Asia, I would have to say uh, Shanghai or Beijing. Uh, in terms of Pakistan, uh, my exposure is pretty limited, but I love Islamabad a lot. You know, I've heard good things about Karachi and Lahore. What scares me a little bit about those places is it sounds like they are massive. I didn't realize, I think somebody told me uh, yesterday that Karachi is 20 plus million yeah, and La is. Lahore is around 15 million. Um, one of the reasons I love Islamabad is we're looking at, what, two or three million people, lots of green trees, beautiful uh, open space, beautiful mountains that align the city. So even if and when I travel to those other cities, I'm pretty sure Islamabad will remain at the top of my list. Yeah, I'm sure it is. So indeed, uh, a very good news for Islamabadis who are into the city wars with the Lahore and Karachiites that, you know, Islamabad, Islamabad is the best city in, 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 in the opinion of Chris. I'm an Islamabadi, so I'm, you know, very proud to hear that. So, Chris, what's your favorite food? Uh, uh, anything Italian. Uh, I'll, I'll eat pretty quickly and easily. Yeah. Any, you, you tried anything Pakistani yet? Uh, Pakistani food? Uh, yes, I've eaten tons of Pakistani food. You'll have to forgive me, though, because my Urdu is not good enough to remember the pronunciation of them. Uh -huh. Uh, as well as the names. Here is my challenge in battle, uh, being a visitor coming to Pakistan. Uh, you know, I arrived here in Islamabad weighing roughly 210 uh, pounds. I'm fairly confident I will be returning to California at around 220. Why? Your food here is so amazing. Once you stop, start eating, you can't stop. You, I think you've done a great job if you if you think you've only built up ten pounds only, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's important, though. I don't think a lot of Americans know and appreciate how good Pakistani food is uh, because it's, uh, you know, I, I did some research. It looks like the Pakistani diaspora in the U.S. is roughly a million, hmm. and diaspora being defined as people who were either born or uh, who were immigrated from yeah. Pakistan or they live there where they were born in the US but they identify as Pakistani and then it looks like in uh, California we have about 70,000 uh, Pakistanis in terms of the diaspora the point being um, it's it's uh, when you're in the Bay Area you will uh, run into a lot of the Pakistani diaspora less so in other parts of California has been my experience but because of that we don't have a lot of local Pakistani restaurants to go to and experiment with uh, so uh, that means my exposure is pretty limited to getting on a plane and coming here and having a, a good friend take me to the best local restaurant they can find. Great, fantastic. It's great to hear that. So uh, 10 million users or 10 million in revenue, what would you prefer uh, in a startup? <laughs> You know, because I'm not uh, a 25-year-old uh, with a lot of runway left in front of me, uh, I would, and with my Midwest algorithm and knowing how hard it is to actually build and grow a business that is profitable, I'd take the safe bet, 10 million yeah. cash. Great. Uh, and what's your best mistake? Um, yeah. You ask really good questions. We're going to have to nominate you for a, a podcast award here. <laughs> uh, but but I, I, for me, it's a no-brainer. I, I have no fear of making a mistake or failing. Sometimes making a mistake gets you into trouble. Uh, sometimes failing uh, gets you into a difficult situation. But 
overall, over the, cor- the arc of a lifetime, I feel like the, the advantages of moving forward, fear or failure notwithstanding, outweigh the potential downside. And I think it's a, just a good way to generally live life as well. So the rapid fire round is done now. Uh, but in the end, I'm just you know, going to ask you if you have any particular message for uh, Pakistani startup founders? Yeah, another good question. I, I think, I do have a piece of advice that I think is a little bit different than what most people would give. Um, and it would be as follows. Make sure you understand what you're getting into and that you're cut out for it. And let me elaborate by what I mean just a little bit. I think many young entrepreneurs, at least in the U.S., uh, but but I've also seen signs of this in Pakistan as well, they can become enamored with the startup game, the startup name, and the startup theater. And when, when they launch their company, particularly in a good economy and environment that we all saw where valuations were crazy and it was easy to get easy money before March of 2022, uh, fundraising wasn't that difficult for a lot of ideas that probably shouldn't have received investment money, certainly not as much as they received or at the valuations they received. So a lot of people are misled into thinking, I know what I'm doing. I'm really good at this. This is fun because now I can post on LinkedIn that I received a $1.2 million investment from a local or a foreign venture capital fund. But they don't know that once you get the money, the hard part has just started. Now you need to take that money and spend the next year turning that investment into one million in revenue. And even then you're probably not going to be profitable. It is not until years three or four that you've grown your revenue to two or three or four million that you become profitable. And that is very, very difficult to do. And I think only the serious entrepreneurs that do this for the right reason survive through phases one, two, and three that I've just described. I think the people that get into this game because of the startup theater that we often all see, once they get through phase one, they raise their money, they realize I'm either not ready for or able to do phases two and three. And that's where the situation gets messy for everyone. So I think one thing that universities, guest speakers in classrooms, accelerators, incubators, professors could all improve upon is doing a better job laying out for young people. Here's what the journey really entails and here's where the dark moments will occur. Are you sure this is for you? And if the answer is no, that's okay, because it may mean that they just need to come back to it at a later point in their life when they're ready or more ready or more emotionally and intellectually ready for that challenge than they may be at age 21 or 25 or 28. So not necessarily the most uplifting of messages, but Again, I think it's important to be honest and realistic with young people about what this journey is really like. If it works, though, we all know the end result, the freedom, the liberation, the financial security that succeeding can give a person, their spouse, their family, their kids, their early employees, their investors. That's the magic and secret sauce of, I think, why a lot of people are in this game. Right. So this so this is the end of our podcast uh, or episode for today. Uh, Stay tuned to National Incubation Center uh, to learn more uh, from people who are visiting National Incubation Center. Uh, See you next time.